Uh, but I will be leading this workshop along with Eli, yeah, and I'll let him introduce himself now. Hi, my name is Elijah Clark. My, I have my full name in the Zoom chat, don't mind that. I am a data fellow here at the Direct Science Library, and I am also a statistics student here at Florida State University. All right, and with that, I think we'll get started. So this is the introduction to our workshop hosted by me and Eli. Here are some of the topics that we'll be discussing in this workshop. Uh, we're gonna talk about what base R and R studio are. Uh, we are going to uh, talk about how to create variables, aka objects, as well as data sets. We are going to go over arithmetic functions, importing data, um, ANOVA and linear regressions. We'll make a few graphs and at the end we'll have a Q&A. Now if you have a quick question, feel free to drop it in the chat and someone will reply to you, but if it's something longer that you want a more in-depth response on, please save it to the end. Um, we'll also be doing live coding in this workshop, so we encourage you to follow along. All right, so if you want to follow along with the live coding, you can log on to FSU Virtual Lab following the instructions on the screen. Uh, there should be a link in your chat. Just use your FSU ID to log in. Once you're logged in, you can click the apps button on the top of the screen. It should take you to a page full of applications, and you can scroll until you find RStudio. Uh, click it, and it should bring, you, bring up a couple of options. Click open, and you should be able to use that. So if for whatever reason you can't use FSU Virtual Lab, remember that RStudio is a free open source program. You can download it onto your computer, uh, but it will be faster to go to use Virtual Lab for this. So I'll give you all a minute to do that if anyone wants to follow along. So before we get into how to use R, let's talk about what R is. So R is an open source programming language that is used in statistical analysis. And you'll hear a lot of people use the term base R that can refer both to the language itself and the default console that the language is used in. So keep in mind the programming language base R does not have to be used in the base R console. It can be used within RStudio, which is what we'll be working with today, as well as a few other programs. Okay, so let's talk about RStudio. Uh, we recommend people use RStudio to start out. And to be honest, even if you're not starting out, we also recommend it for a few reasons. It is the most popular console for the base R language, which means that there are plenty of communities, tutorials, and other online resources designed for um, RStudio. It's a streamlined system, so administrative tasks go a lot quicker, and it has an easier learning curve than base R. Here's just a quick side-by-side -side of what the default base R console looks like next to RStudio. If you have it open in your virtual lab, this is what RStudio should look like. Here's another quick picture of base R, and you can see that it's one panel where you basically do everything. And here's RStudio, which has four panels. So the bottom left panel, panel three, this is very similar to what base R looks like. This is where you'll do most of your work and right after code. Right now, next to that in the bottom right is where you'll, is panel four. This is where you'll find uh, your files, your, your packages, and you'll be able to view graphs. Right above that in panel two, that is your environment, which is what will allow you to keep track of objects and data sets. And panel one in the top left is where you can run scripts. So we'll go over all these things in this presentation. Don't worry about remembering what I just said. It'll become a lot more clear when we do, do our live coding. All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is objects. And objects are one of the most important things to learn in R. It is basically a variable that R can read and understand. Um, they are a useful way of storing information, whether it's a single value, multiple values, or an entire data set. And you can even store several objects into one object. So we're gonna talk about all the different forms of data and the different types of objects that you can make with this, this data. All right, so let's start with data types. So here are all the different types of data. The first type is numeric data. These are just your numbers. They can be whole numbers or they can be decimal. Um, the second type are character data. Um, these are words or categories. And when you're putting in character data, they have to be in quotes for R to understand them. And numeric and character data will probably be the most common type of data you work with. So these are the ones we're gonna focus on. The next category is integer data. These are whole numbers and they have to end with a capital R for R to, or, I'm sorry, they have to end with a capital L for R to read them as integers. The next type are logical data, and this is just true or false. And they will be, they have to be in all caps for R to read them as logical data rather than character variables. Another type is complex data, and this just deals with impossible numbers. And the final type is raw data. 
Rot and complex data are both pretty rare. You probably won't be working with them very often. So we're not really going to go over them in an introductory course, but we wanted to let you know that they exist. And so here are the types of objects that you can make using these various data types. So the first type are atomic vectors, usually just called vectors. And this is the most basic type of object in R and it contains one line of one type of data. So this could be a line of numeric values or a line of character values or whatever. The second type are lists and they are made up of one line with multiple different types of data. So vectors contain one type of data, lists contain multiple different types of data. And then you have factors and factors are actually a type of object that are made from vectors and they store the categories in a vector by level. So if you made a vector that has a bunch of categorical variables, um, the factor would be a way to store that by level. You have an example right here of a list of different seasons and the vector, vector would have, or I'm sorry, the factor would have three different seasons in it. So the next type are matrices and matrices are two dimensional storage grids with one type of data. And usually that type is numeric. So it's basically a two-dimensional vector. A vector is one row or one column of one type of data, and a matrix can contain multiple rows and columns of one type of data. And these are also not super common. The next type are data frames, and this is a two-dimensional storage grid with multiple types of data. So this is basically a two-dimensional list. It's very useful for storing tables or data sets. And this is a very common type of object to use in R. And the final type are arrays. And these can store multiple dimensions with one type of data, usually numbers. So it's similar to a matrix, but while a matrix can only have two dimensions, arrays can have three or more. And like matrices, these aren't super common, so we're not really going to spend a lot of time on matrices and arrays in an introductory course. All right, so this is just a quick chart to go over the different types of objects just to help you understand it. You have on the top one type of data versus multiple types of data. So one type of data, it would be all character variables or all numeric variables or something like that. Multiple types, it would be a mix. Then you have one dimension, two dimension, and multiple dimensions. This can just help you keep everything straight. All right, so now that we talk about what an object is, how do we make them? The operator that you would use to make an object is a less than sign and a dash, which as we can see, looks like an arrow. So the setup would be the name of the object, less than dash, and then whatever information you want to store. So you can see a few examples here. You can put a less than dash 10.5, and then every time you type in the letter a, r will read that as 10.5. So if you wanted to make a vector with multiple values, you would put the name of the object, less than dash, then you would put a c with the parentheses, and within those parentheses, you would list out your values separated by commas. So since these are character values, they're in quotes, if they weren't character values, you wouldn't put quotes, but you would still need the commas, the parentheses, and the C. So if you wanted to make factors out of this factor, you'd have three different levels, one for each season. Then you would put the name of the new object, less than dash, factor, and then in quotes, you would put the name of the object, which in this case is Z. You can do basic arithmetic with objects in R using the plus sign, the minus sign, an asterisk for multiplication, and a forward slash for division. If you wanted to view the results, you can use a print statement. So you'd write print, open parentheses, two plus two, and then close parentheses, and then R would calculate that and give you the answer for. Um, you can do arithmetic using vectors, data frames, matrices, and arrays. As long as they have numbers in it, you can do arithmetic in it. And if objects are different lengths, you can still do arithmetic with them, but R will probably give you a warning and let you know that they are different lengths. Um, how it will operate is when it gets to the end of one object, it'll just start from the beginning until the longest object is complete. Okay, so now we have our very first exercises. So hopefully you have um, FSU Virtual Lab opened up. If you don't, please do that now. Uh, the link should still be in the chat and I will hand it off to Eli to introduce these and then give you a minute to complete them. Hi, so we have two exercises kind of. I, let's focus on the first one first, where we have x equals 20 and y equals 4. So the question is, how can we make objects out of x equals 20 and y equals 4 and then proceed to add, multiply, divide, and subtract? Well, add subtract, multiply, divide the two of them and print those results. I'll give you all a minute to do it. I'll demonstrate it once the minute's up. 
Um, all right. So this is a personal preference on my end. I like coding in the bottom R console. I started coding in base R. Some people prefer coding up here. So what? I, so in order to make x, I'll do x equals 20. And can everybody see this, by the way? Feel free to raise your hand if you if you can, just to just to double check or a thumbs up. Looks like the majority of everybody can see it. All right. So we have x, the arrow combo 20, y, 4. Like, let's say I want to make an object named add, add, because that one isn't a function. And so you don't have to do it in open parentheses or close parentheses. I like doing it that way because it will keep track of order of operations for you if you do that. And with more complicated formulas, it's useful to be able to separate things with parentheses. I'm going to go ahead and do it all in one fell swoop with each object so that we can print it. But hopefully this will demonstrate that R, I like to think of R as a giant calculator. It's a very, very complica complicated calculator when it comes to some of the stuff it can do. But it's a really just a big calculator. Well, it is a big calculator. So if you do the print function like I just did there, it'll usually give you this little one and then what your result is to the side. So 20 plus 4 is 24. That would that makes sense to me. So if you open up the print function with the parentheses, just make sure your object is spelled the exact same way. Something I like about R Studio in particular is that it'll usually populate functions and objects that well, um, well, functions down here that are already part of R, and then objects you've made. So if you have an object that's really long, and you're like, okay, I don't remember all of the the whole spelling of it, that's pretty helpful in my opinion. Multiplying. We can print multiplying. Should be 80. It is. Print. Dividing. I believe that's the name of the object. That is 5. Uh, what questions do y'all have about this exercise so far? Second exercise where we have, let's say we have 401,000 like 15,444 Starbucks locations in the United States. There's like 50 states, five inhabited territories in Washington, D.C. So that's 57 areas that are populated in the U.S. Uh, normally, this would be a situation where we would have the number of stores per each area. But let's say we don't have that information. We just have the total. So we can make an assumption and be like, okay, we don't know exactly how many are in each location, but we can come up with an average. So the exercise is make two objects for the number of Starbucks locations in U.S. territories to figure out the average number of Starbucks locations per U.S. state or territory. Okay. So... Let's say we have total Starbucks stores. Can everybody see the code here at the bottom? Okay, so we know for a fact, thanks to the wonderful site known as Statista, that there are 15,444 Starbucks locations. And we have a total of 57 US states and territories. I don't know if I spelled that right. Thankfully, spelling doesn't matter in R, just as long as you remember to spell the objects correctly. Not my strong suit. <laughs> All right. Average Starbucks stores. We will have total Starbucks stores. I love R Studio and how it will remember how I spelled things. So I don't have to type it. 
in base R, usually you have to remember exactly what you named your objects as. Oh. Oh. I almost forgot the arrow, the little hyphen. I should have known better. We can print average Starbucks stores. It'll pull it up there. And it is about 270 of them. All righty. Okay, so as I was saying, a note on functions. A function is when you give R instructions to do something. So we talked about the print function in the last exercise. And that is a good example of how a function works. Uh, when you're doing a function, you would write out the name of the function followed by parentheses with your data in the parentheses. So this is an example right here, name of function parentheses. So in the last exercise, we used arithmetic to calculate the mean. However, this isn't always efficient with large data sets. So you can use the mean function and put the name of the object in the parentheses, whatever the variable you're working with. And you can also do this with median and quartiles. So throughout this presentation, if I say use this function, this is the format you would use. All right, so now let's talk about making data frames. There are two ways to do this. You can import data, which we'll talk about in a minute, or you can make them from scratch. And if you make them from scratch, you have to start out by making a vector for each variable. So we talked about how to make a vector before, but just to go over it again briefly, uh, you put the name of the vector, in this case, the variable name, you put less than dash, then you put a C and open parentheses, you list out your values with commas in between them, and then close parentheses. Once you have all your vectors ready, you use the data frame function, which is data.frame, and you list out all your vectors you want to combine in the parentheses, of course, with commas in between them. And of course, you can save that data frame as an object so you can refer to it later. So if you want to look at your data frame, you can use the print function and then just put the name of your data frame. So just to go over that again, you would make a vector for each variable, then use the data.frame function to combine those vectors into one data set. So if you're working with larger data sets, maybe it's not practical to make them all from scratch. So that's a case where you might want to import your data. One way to do that is using your read function. You can put read.csv or whatever file type you're using, and then put the file path in parentheses and in quotation marks. So when you do this, you have to make sure you're using forward slashes in your file path and make sure your file uh, path is also in quotes. So just in case you're not sure what I, what, what I mean when I say file path, here's an easy way to find it. Just find the file on your computer, right click it, click on properties if you're using a Windows computer or get info if you're using a Mac and you'll find all the information about the file path. It should be listed in the location. So if all of that sounds very complicated to you, there are easier ways to do that within RStudio. So in panel four, which remember is the bottom right panel, you can look through your files on your computer and right click the file you wanna import. And there should be an option that says import data set. Um, another option is that in panel two, which is the top right section, there should be a button that just says import data set that you can click and it will help you out doing that. So those are also options within RStudio if you don't wanna go through the file path option. Once you have your imported data, you might also want to make vectors out of your newly created data frame. So we talked earlier about how to make a bunch of vectors and then combine them into one data frame. Now we're gonna talk about how to take a data frame and break it up into smaller vectors. And the way you do that is by creating an ob object with the same format we've been using, dash less, or less than dash, same exact format. And on the other side of the vector, you would put the name of the, of the data frame with a dollar sign, no spaces, and the name of the variable that you want to turn into a vector. And you can even combine these de vectors to make another data frame and so on. So you would write the name of your, the name of the object you want to create, less than dash, the name of your data frame, a dollar sign, and then your variable name. All right, so everybody makes mistakes and that includes R. So sometimes when you're importing a data set, um, it will categorize a certain variable into the wrong type. So you may have a numeric variable in R that is reading as a character variable for whatever reason, but this can be fixed. The first thing you have to do is use the class function to figure out what type of data a certain variable is stored as. So the way you do that is, is by typing class within parentheses, put in the name of the variable. 
the name of the object that you created for the variable. So if you want to change the data, the data type, if it's stored as the wrong form of data and you want to change the data type, you can use the as.numeric function to store it as a numeric variable. If you wanted to store it as an integer, you would use as.integer and so on. You want to store it as character, as.character. All right, so now we have another exercise where you can practice data importation. This is a Starbucks data set that we will be referring to later. So keep that in your back pocket and I will let Eli introduce this. All right, uh, did everyone see the link I put in the chat? Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you did. I In that folder, I put a data set. It is open source from Kaggle involving Starbucks nutritional data. It is in CSV format. Um, I could, I also have an Excel version on my end as well. And so the idea is I'm not going to tell you which way to do it. You can do it with the base R way of importing it. You can do it with the import button. The goal here is just to import it. And let's make some objects for calories, caffeine, and milk type specifically. You can also check to also check to make sure that calories and caffeine are stored as numeric or character data. If any of them are not stored numerically, that you would it would be preferable for them to be stored as, such as caffeine or calories, for example. Let's create we can create some variables to make them numeric. And then from there, let's get the mean and median caloric content and caffeine content for the average Starbucks drink. I'll give you all a minute. All right. I'm gonna make an object for Starbucks data. And what I'm going to do, I copy pasted from the properties one. I'm also going to double check because I know with uh, Windows 11, I don't know why file paths do this, but they do, where it decides to do the forward, the backward slash instead of the forward one. Let's see. Hopefully I remember how to do this. Read.csv is for base R. There are some libraries that do it otherwise. Let's see, OneDrive. This is the file path just to get to my instance of the... If this doesn't work, I'll also just do this. Rubik's data forward slash. I have the property file around here. Dot .csv. I'm going to select all and copy it just in case I do this wrong. Oh, I did it right the first time. I feel like I have been spoiled by the import buttons as of late. I, I originally learned R in 2016, where a lot of these nifty little functions were not available. Let's see if I can find the Excel version that I have saved on my desktop as well. Let's see. I have this version that is the Microsoft. Let's see. Oh, the one I saved on my desktop is uh, not the Excel version. But what I can do, fellowship files, let's see, go to, I can go to my Starbucks data and import down here. Let's see. I'll show you all the Excel spreadsheet version as well. Import data set. This one's a lot easier. It'll even download the library. That'll be for a later topic and just automate all of this code for you, which I find to be a lot easier. So you don't have to go through all that pathfinding stuff. The pathfinding stuff is still useful in case you need to troubleshoot stuff. So I gave the option of doing it both ways. Personally, I prefer the CS. I personally prefer CSV files. You don't need to do that. That said, let's make 
calories as an object. So we assign it and I'm going to, first we have our data set of Starbucks data. I like to think of the dollar sign as a hand grabbing into a box because we have the data frame of Starbucks data as our initial box. And we are going to pull out calories to make it a vector. We can also do this with milk type. Milk type. My personal favorite is soy milk. Starbucks data. Do the dollar sign again to reach in and grab milk type. I ha We have character and numeric in there. I'm going to choose character type. And lastly, and as a side note up here, another feature I like about RStudio is that you can see your data set up here as well to know what's going on and visually see what's going on. BaseR does not have this option. Finally, and I did showed you that because caffeine is all the way at the very end as our last column. Caffeine is Starbucks data set. We are grabbing from, from our object Starbucks data. And we can go down. I press the up key to get to the bottom of this populated list. And we can check to see what class we have for all of these calories. Class calories. That's an integer. Calorie. Calories two. Not a very creative name, but that's okay. I just want it to be separate from calories so it doesn't overwrite the first object I made for the first calorie type. But I do want it in numeric form. As we can also use equals here. This is slightly different, but it still will make another object. And it won't override the first calories object I made. We can also see class milk type. I, I hope it's in character because I selected the character type. It is. If I had done numeric, it wouldn't pop up as numeric. It wouldn't pop up as character. It would pop up as numeric. Finally, let's see if caffeine class caffeine that one is a character variable for some reason. As you can see down here in this over, this column over here, the, those are numbers. But the reason that's the case is because if we scroll down further in the data set, there's some entries that are varies. So what we can do here is create an object called more caffeine. I just, or you can name them whatever you want. I just wanted to name it more caffeine equals as numeric caffeine. Oh, I feel like this is a good time to remind everyone R is case sensitive. I accidentally made caffeine all lowercase. Caffeine with an uppercase this time. So it'll recognized by that. So there's a warning message I want to point out here. It did give me warning message, NA is induced by coercion. So varies, if we print our more caffeine, more caffeine, the varies became NAs. We could, you can even do another little function in our, well, I shouldn't call it little. It does a very big and important thing. Let's say if I wanted to have even more caffeine and do na.omit for more caffeine and then print even more caffeine. It will have subsequently gotten rid of every single NA that we had in that object. I'm going to keep both of these objects for now. R can sometimes get rid of NAs for you, and other times it won't. I highly, highly recommend 
in a dot omit, keeping that in mind as another function in the back pocket. But finally, we wanted to calculate the mean and median of calories, caffeine. Oh yeah, just calories and caffeine. You can't really get a mean of a character type. I, I don't know how to do that anyway. Um, so let's say we want the mean calories two because, well, I think you can take means of integers, but I want to take the mean of this one. So we have, on average, 193 calories with a median. of calories two as 185. And then we want to do... I'm going to do more caffeine because I also want to show... Oh, wait. No, it, this is why I put na.omit because sometimes R will not know to get rid of or when making it, NAs were induced by coercion to make more caffeine, but because of those NAs, it will not calculate it. So that's why I made even more caffeine. Finally, we'll take the median of even more caffeine. And so the average, the mean of a Starbucks beverage that we have caffeine content data on is 89, and the median that we have data on is 75. And that's how to do that. Let's get into some data analysis then. And um, we'll start with ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. And just a quick primer, just in case you've been on a stats class for a while and you don't know what I'm talking about, this is just a procedure for analyzing the statistical significance of differences between the mean scores of two or more groups on one or more independent variables. So a less formal way to think about that, a simpler way of saying that is just that we're comparing the mean and spread of a quantitative variable between two or more categories. So for example, this chart compares the average lifespan between dogs and cats. All right, to do a one-way ANOVA, like the example we just showed you, you're going to need an independent variable. This would be your categorical variable, so it would be a character variable and a dependent variable, and this would be a numeric variable. And to run the ANOVA function, you would put AOV, then in parentheses, you would put the Y variable, a squiggly line, and then the X variable. The Y variable would always go first. And of course, you can save this as an object if you want to refer to it later. To view the results, you would put summary and then in parentheses, the name of the object. And just as a side note, if you wanted to run a two-way ANOVA, you would list the two X values with a plus sign between them. So you would do AOV, open parentheses, Y value, squiggly line, the first X value plus the second X value in close parentheses. So this is a breakdown of how we did the earlier example with the cats and the dogs. Um, you can see the first two lines of code are just making an object for each variable we want to use, the, um, whether it's a cat or a dog, the type of animal, and the average lifespan. Then in the third line, you can see the ANOVA function. It's being saved as an object called cat dog ANOVA. It's AOV, open parentheses, average lifespan, that is the Y variable, with a squiggly line, and then cat dog character, that's the X variable, close parentheses and then a summary function to look at the results. And this is what the results look like. All right, so now we're going to use a built-in data set to do this exercise. You don't need to import anything. This is a data set that has already comes in with R and you're going to do your own ANOVA analysis using a data set on um, the tooth growth patterns of guinea pigs. So for whatever reason, R just has this built in. We're gonna see how different supplements affect the length of growth among the teeth of guinea pigs. And we're going to use an ANOVA to calculate the variance. And just as a hint at the bottom, this is what the ANOVA function looks like. So I'll give you a, moment, a minute to do this. And then Eli, Eli will show you um, the example using live coding. Okay. Thankfully, we don't have to, as Simi mentioned a couple minutes ago, we don't have to import this. It is built into R. If I do a print function, we get this little table down here of the length, the supplement type, and the dosage. We're not going to be working with the dosage in this exercise, but that might be something cool to experiment with later if y'all want. What I want to do is 
compare length and supplement type with the supplement type for VC being vitamin C tablet. It's a whole vitamin C tablet, whereas OJ is orange juice. So I want to do length. Almost had it with an M instead of a... I'm going to name it tooth length because length is a function in R. So we have tooth growth. Do the little dollar sign to indicate I am going to be pulling from this da data set and putting this into and duplicating it and putting it into another box to make it a vector. We can also do this with the supplement. I'm going to make a supplement type object to turn that into another vector and pull from the tooth growth data set. Do my dollar sign to indicate I am grabbing from that data frame and make it pulling this, pulling sup and duplicating that into this vector. From here, we can do tooth ANOVA or name it any kind of object name you want. The structure, the name doesn't matter as long as the structure is consistent. AOV to open up the ANOVA function. And the Y is tooth length, because that's our response variable. Do a tilde to supplement type, which is our independent variable that we have control over. Hmm. Oh, I accidentally used the data frame. I did not keep my object names together. That's OK. I can do this. Again, R is very picky about making sure you name things correctly. I think most programs are. Tooth length. I have the correct object. R will tell you if it doesn't understand what you're doing. And then we can do summary to pull up our um, statistics table for tooth ANOVA. Tuthanova. As a side note, significance codes down here are always provided in R, but only if it's at the 90% confidence level. It's also very tiny for that significance level. It's a very, it is one period. We have our degrees of freedom, some squares, mean square, F, L, A, all the, all the stuff that one would get from an ANOVA or linear regression or any other kind of statistical analysis that spits out p-values. OK, now we are going to talk about regression. Um, if you need a quick primer on that, uh, here it is. It is the relationship between the estimated value of a dependent variable and the corresponding values of one or more independent variables. So again, in layman's terms, we're just looking at the relationship between two quantitative variables. Um, the chart on the screen shows the relationship between the amount of time the student studies, that is the x variable, and their GPA, that is the y variable. And in order to do a linear regression, we're going to need two variables, and both need to be numeric. So to perform a regression function, you would type in lm, and in parentheses, you would type the y variable, then a squiggly line, and then the x variable. It's very similar to the ANOVA uh, format. And of course, you can also save this as an object and use the summary function to view it. If you wanted to do a multiple regression, uh, you can list out your x values with a plus sign between them. Again, similar to a two-way ANOVA, you put LM, open parentheses, Y variable, squiggly line, and then your x variables plus the, your next x variable plus your third x variable, and so on, with a closed parentheses. And that's how you do a multiple regression. So going back to the example that we talked about earlier, the relationship between time studied and GPA, this is the code we would use. Again, those first two lines of code are just establishing each variable and creating an object for each variable. The first one for GPA, the second one for time spent studying. The third line of code is just running your linear regression. Again, GPA goes first because that's the Y variable. Then it's quickly, then time spent studying. We saved that as an object and then ran a summary with that object. And the results look like this. 
Okay, so we're gonna do another exercise with the linear regression. We're gonna use another built-in data set. This one is on tree growth and we're going to predict the height of trees using the girth. So height is going to be the Y variable in this and girth is going to be the X variable. And once again, the function is LM and in parentheses Y squiggly line X. So I'll give you guys a minute to do that and then I will give the floor back to Eli. Okay. Share it. All right. Picking back up where we left off. This time we're going to print trees. That'd be cool if we could print real trees, but I will be printing the data set for trees. We have the girth, height, and volume of 31 trees. I, we did not make these trees. I'm, I'm assuming someone went out in the forest somewhere and measured all of this. I don't know. <laughs> But this is another one of ours built-in data sets, and we can make objects out of, out of this. So we can make tree girth. Do the, the object operation. We're going to pull from the trees data set and put, go ahead and sell it with our little dollar sign. I would like to grab the information on girth and turn it, put it, duplicate it and put it into this object, please. And uh, we will also do the same with tree height. Do our minus sign hyphen, grabbing from the in the built-in trees data set, do our dollar sign to say we are grabbing from that data frame. And we will be grabbing height from it to duplicate it and put it into our new object, tree height. We will going to do, now I'm going to do, tree regression and turn that into an object lm for linear model and i believe if i remember correctly i mean i think we're going to do height height tilde girth to see if the width of a tree corresponds to its height oh right i did not name those objects that Tree regression with the correct object name this time. Oh, I misspelled girth there too. Wonderful. I it, I'll just I'll just think of it as a box that had the label misspelled. Tree height. Wait, no, we were gonna do height to girth. And we can do a summary of tree regression. Oh, tree regression. Summary of tree regression, not summary of tree regression. All right. We, it's a little bit of a longer summary output down here. We still have it. It'll give you the exact formula you specified down here along with all of your residuals, as we have two quantitative variables this time. It will give you your line intercept and your the uh, p-value for the object that you are placing as your, deep in, your independent variable. With the significance codes, it will also give you an f-statistic, a r-squared and adjusted r-squared for it, in case you happen to want those. You might not want those. And that's that on lin on pure linear regression. One line, one one way. Okay, so now let's show off our results. And we can do that using the plot function in base R. So this time the X variable goes first. So going back to the data on tooth growth that we talked about, we're going to plot supplement and length. So if you were to try it out, which you don't have to type this in, but if you were, it would look something like this. You would use plot function in parentheses, you would put sup or whatever the name of your object is, comma, lin. And then this plot would come up. And you would probably see this in panel four. That will be the one on your bottom right hand corner in RStudio. Yes. 
All right, so now let's do the same thing with trees. We can plot girth and height. And if you'll notice, if you just try it yourself, or if you just look at the graph on the screen, you'll notice that something is different. So the previous data set created a box plot, and this one is a scatter plot, even though we use the same function. So when you use the plot function, R will automatically figure out what is the best way to display this data, which can be a really useful feature if you don't know how to present a certain piece of data. Now, if you wanted to add something like a regression line to this plot, you would add plus AB line, and then in parentheses, you would put your linear regression formula. And then a regression line would appear on your scatter plot. Now, if you save your linear regression as an object, you can just put the name of the object within the AB line parentheses. So then it would just be AB line parentheses, your name of the object. And that would be useful if you had a longer code. So that's how you would make a graph with, within base R. All right, now we're gonna talk for a minute about installing a package. So a package is basically a bundle of functions that you can download into R. And there are over 10,000 available packages with a bunch of different features that we can talk about. So to install a package, you would use the name of the function install.packages and then in parentheses and quotation marks, you would put the name of the package. Now to open a package, you would use the library function and then in parentheses, you would put the name of the package that you wanted to open. You only need to install a package once. Once you install a package one time, or we'll just remember it forever and you'll never need to install it again. However, you do need to open a package using the library function every single time you open R. If you open R and you do not use library function, it is not going to know what you were talking about. So make sure you do that. It's very easy for, to forget, but please try. Um, if you want a list of packages that, you're, that are available for download, GitHub has a really good list. It's a curated list called Awesome R. There's a link to it right here. And just to let you know, some packages, a lot of packages are available within R itself. So all you would need to do is type install.packages and then name it. But some of them you will have to download onto your computer beforehand. Uh, but the ones we'll be working with are all available within R. So I'll let Eli just demonstrate how packages work for a second. R doesn't uninstall a package unless you make it uninstall a package. I deliberately uninstalled this package for demonstration purposes. Install packages, in quotation marks, beeper. It'll, uh, it's thinking, it's saying, hmm, I think I'm gonna do it. It'll take a little bit of time. There we go. Installing into my OneDrive over here as the library location is unspecified, but that's fine. R is thinking, I'm going to, ah, yeah. It pulled it from where it wanted to, and now it is on my computer. So I can do, there's a special function only available via beeper. Beep. One. Or is it sound? Oh, library. To, in order to use it. I believe it was sound one. Oh. There we go. Beeper's kind of weird. I've only seen it applied if somebody wants to make a very long script and at the very end have it do the little thing at the end. Likewise, library ggplot2. I have ggplot2 already installed. For the next exercise, um, I'm going to recommend that y'all do install.packages similar to how I had install packages beeper, have the parentheses and quotation marks inside, ggplot2. All right, so today we'll be installing and using the ggplot2 package. Go ahead and do that if you haven't already. Um, this is one of the most common packages within R. A lot of R users prefer this to make graphs because of all of the functions and customizations that it has, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, to start, any ggplot graph has to start with the word ggplot, and then in parentheses, you'd put the name of the data frame, comma, AES. And then in another set of parentheses, you would put the X variable, comma, the Y variable. That is how you would start any ggplot code. It seems like a lot, but it wouldn't be that much, I promise. After you started that portion of the code, you would add more features and functions using the plus sign on the same line. So all the ggplot functions, you have to do them on the same line. You can't just skip a line and do that. So going back to the two's growth data again, if we wanted to make that same box plot, we would start with that baseline that I talked about, ggplot, and then in parentheses, 
tooth growth, comma, AES, and the X and Y variables, which is SUP and LEN. From here, you would add plus geome underscore box plot. And then it would have parentheses at the end, but you don't have to put anything in those parentheses. So the whole line of code would look like this at the bottom. ggplot, open parentheses, tooth growth, comma, AES, and SUP and LEN in parentheses with a comma in between, close parentheses, plus geome underscore box plot. That's what it would look like. And if you run that, you should get a box plot. So going back to the trees data, let's do the same thing. You start out with the same baseline. You just swap out the name of the data frame and the X and Y variables. Again, we're using girth and height. The name of the, uh, the data frame is trees. From here, we would add a scatter plot, which would be plus geom underscore point. Finally, we can add a regression line, which would be plus geom underscore smooth. And in parentheses, you would put method equals LM, which would be in quotes. And the whole line of code would look the whole line of code would look like this. Okay, ggplot trees, comma, AES, girth height, plus geom point, plus geom smooth, and the method would be LM. ggplot can be kind of long and clunky, as you guys can see, but it has a lot of features and it is very useful. Honestly, we could do an entire course on just ggplot features. So there's a lot to play around with. Here are some of the other features that you can add to your ggplot graph. The first one is labels. If you wanted to add any sort of labels on your x and y value, you'd put plus labs, and then in parentheses, you'd put s equals whatever name, x equals whatever the name of the x, the x axis is, comma, y equals whatever you want to call your y axis. Remember to put the label names in quotes and to separate each one with a comma. Another detail you can do is adding colors. So like I said, when you put plus geom underscore box plot or plus geom underscore point, it's going to show up with parentheses. You can leave that blank or inside it, you can put any details like color. These are just some examples of some color features you can add. Um, and of course, you can also export your plots um, and save them on your computer as various file types like PNG or JPEG. This would be in panel four, which is the bottom right, the bottom right panel. And that way you can use them in another project. So I will hand it off to Eli again to show what a lot of these back, what a lot of these features look like in action. With our first graph being, we're going to do a numeric comparison of our caffeine to calories, but with a visual line going through. Well, actually, for, well, first we're going to want to see what's going on with the old data set that we imported. A while ago, well, for our linear regression, we're going to compare numeric caffeine to calories. We won't be using the object that was character-based. And for our NOVA, we'll compare the milk type we that is used for a beverage to our calories, and then we'll graph the results. Uh, do y'all want to do, like, do you want me to show it immediately, or would y'all like to uh, try it on your own for one minute? Y'all can feel free to put it in the chat, what y'all would prefer. Or I'll just do it in a minute. <laughs> um, okay. Let's just give it a minute in case someone wants to try it. Okay. Okay, we got our studio over here. Can everyone still see? Can everyone see the screen here? It's it's starting to get really long with everything we've done during this workshop. And thank you all for being patient. Okay, so we're going to make Starbucks Milk Anova. Not Milk Sonova. Well, it could be plural. Just a object, I am making a box. I will pull from the Starbucks data that we had from a while back. Well, actually, no, we don't because we already made objects. Why am I doing that? AOV, we will do that. We are comparing our Y variable is the milk type. Wait, no, the Y variable is the calories. Calories to had to remember what I named the object. You can usually look up here too, 
to rem to look at your entire environment to see everything you've made. Also, I'm not going to clean that because that'll destroy all of the objects in the whole entire environment. I will go ahead. Anyway, I'm going to go back to the code down here in this console on the bottom left. Do our tilde for calories too for our y variable and our prediction, our predictor variable, our x variable is going to be milk type. Milk type. We'll do a summary of Starbucks milk. I love that little mini, remembering exactly how I spelled it. We can look at our uh, ANOVA output down here, looking at milk type. We can look at the p-value and see that it has three asterisks down here saying it's more or less significant. The type of milk you use is going to impact how many calories are in a beverage. Now, Starbucks caffeine regression. We'll also make this object linear model. We had even more caffeine. Actually, no, we're doing calories too. We're going to see if caffeine content of even more caffeine. I misspelled it as caffeine. Oops. Well, actually, a nifty feature about R's LM function is that it will drop observations that don't have data in it. So it'll if it has an NA, it will say, I'll, I'll actually go ahead and show this. Caffeine regression. It should have 23 observations deleted due to missingness. Older versions of R from about, I say, six years ago, you would need to do an na.omit or na.rm function in order to run this. More newer versions of R will automatically drop these observations that have the NAs. So thankfully, this has calculated how many calories are in a beverage based off of how much caffeine is in it. And uh, it gave us a little significance code down here with the intercept, but not with the caffeine. It's a kind of large p-value there. All right, now we're going to get to ggplot2. ggplot. We're going to have... Starbucks data. We start with our data frame. Comma. AES for aesthetic. Our X variable for our ANOVA was milk type. Milk type, comma, calories two. In order for it to be numeric, plus geome underscore box plot. I'm going to copy this just in case this doesn't work because ggplot can be very picky with how you see how it does things. But we have that. I'll also go ahead and showcase this. I copy pasted it, thankfully. So we can do fill equals, uh, we'll do green to show you how the customization feature of that works. So that just made the inside box green. I can also go ahead and press the export button over here and save as go up to the directory up here. I'll go ahead and put this under, I'll, I'll just save it under here. Milk calories plot. You can go up here to change the file type, PNG, JPEG, TIFF. All these different file types, SVJs are vectors. So if you happen to know Adobe Illustrator and want to customize it from there, you can do that. So go ahead and save that. And now we're going to do the linear regression of our caffeine to calories. ggplot, we will, first we need our data frame that we're pulling from, comma, AES for aesthetic. 
this time our x variable was caffeine well more caffeine more caffeine to calories i need to spell that correctly calories to plus we're going to do I'll showcase what it does with just GM point. Because this is how you make a scatter plot if you don't add an ab line. I copy pasted this just to so that I can show you how to make a, the linear regression itself. So what R is doing is it's making a scatter plot and then it's adding the line of least fit on top of that. So we'll have geom underscore not plus smooth. We're going to do method equals LM. There's other stuff you can put in there for other types of modeling. We will not be going over that today. That is giving me an error. Ah. There we go. We have a very flat line, and it also gives us lit, um, confidence intervals, as we don't have that many points with a lot of caffeine. We have our little confidence intervals that are a bit wider. And we can also save this. The first time you open, the first time you set a file path, it'll stay put until you reopen R. So if you keep making graphs and after, if you want to close R and then reopen it, you'll have to establish your directory again. But as long as you keep your same instance of R open, it'll stay put with the same file directly, directory. All right, so caffeine regression. And I can just save that and I know exactly where it's going to save because it's, I, it's going to be in the same file path directory I sent it to previously. And I will have that saved. And that's how to wrap all of that all up. Okay. That just about wraps it up. I think I'll hand it to Simi for the last little tidbits, and then we'll get to our Q&A. Oh, I started talking while I was still on mute. Okay, so these are just oh, no. the last little miscellaneous points that I want to make. So if you want to save your code, you can do so in panel one, so you can come back and work on it later. You can even save everything we did today if you want to be able to reference it later. Um, if you want to leave a comment or a note to yourself, you can do so using the number sign. Anything that you write after a number sign will not affect how your code runs, so you can leave, use that to leave a note to yourself. And just as another reminder, because it's very easy to forget, if you want to use ggplot or any other package, you need to open it with the library command every time you open R. And here are some more resources to learn about R if you want to expand on what we learned about today. Um, if you want to learn more about ggplot, you can go to Stack Overflow and they have a forum entirely dedicated to that. Uh, there is an R graphics cookbook that you can check out from the FSU library. Um, GitHub has a lot of packages that you can look through if you want to look at other packages other than ggplot. And there's also an entire search engine called rseq that you can use to find answers to many questions. And of course, you can always, always, always ask for assistance from your librarians. You can submit a ticket. We will be happy to help you with any project you have um, revolving around R or any other statistical package. Okay, so all good things must come to an end. So this is the end of our slideshow and the beginning of our Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand. And if you'd like to turn on your mic and we'll call on you to speak. Um, if you want me to go back to a certain slide or you want Eli to open up our studio, to demonstrate something, we would both be happy to do that. I'm also going to go ahead and drop the not typo riddled version of the script I saved beforehand. What I did while demo while coming up with the code is I uh, I have a copy pasted version of the script. I can actually I can share that real quick. Where this is the not as clunky version where I don't have any typos and I also have commentary. The hashtags will tell you which workshop exercise we went through, everything. It'll all work. If you wanted to, you can even run the whole thing and it'll go through. 
Ooh. Uh, I don't want to restart. Or, no. And you can, as a fun factoid, you can resize panels in R as you'd like and customize your layout too. Let's see. Um, okay. Does anyone have any questions? Anything you want us to go back and clarify? All right, well, I think that's all we have. Um, we'll stay on just in case. Oh, you're welcome. Oh, thank uh, you. We'll, we'll stay on just in case anyone has any last minute questions that um, pop into your head, but if not, thank you for attending.